Well, well, well. It's uh, another live stream. Hello, welcome back. Um, my office is currently a bit of a nightmare. So I'm trying to work out where everything sits and everything goes. And my mic cable feels like it's shorter tonight. Anyway. Ah, uh, where are we? Okay. Here we go. Whiskey Saurus, Nick Huzek, Lee Wallace, Vinci. Good to see some of the regulars tuning in nice and early. I uh, really appreciate you tuning in, having a chat with us each night about some great things to do with whiskey, learning a few things along the way, and me answering your questions. I'm Matt Bailey, for those who don't already know me by now. Um, the National Ambassador for the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society. And uh, I'm here at 8 o'clock most nights. Not weekends at the moment, um, but most weeknights here at 8 p.m. And then you can catch this on the story and our Instagram later on. Or you can catch it on our YouTube channel, Scotch Malt Whiskey Society Australia. Mr. Kareem, Mount Boy, Mad Schmoll, Adrian, Keegan, 45 Finn, Mr. Uh, Mr. Kareem, there you go, you got two shout outs. Adrian Whiskey, um, thank you all for tuning in. Um, so, I want to talk, I want to touch on a couple of things to do with Pete. Pete, 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 P E A T, Pete. Uh, I want to touch on the differences between types of peat, types of flavor, where peat comes from, where it's used. So let's let's touch on this for a second. Peat is the is the prepubescent coal, is the decomposed earth. Uh, human, it's like it's it's decomposed earth matter that is it's mossy earth matter that is uh, cut out of the earth, turned into briquette-sized pieces, and then dried out. In the old-fashioned way of making Scotch whiskey, it would have been dried out on giant stacks, and then uh, it would have taken a few weeks of drying. These days, it's fairly commercially dried, and it goes to malting houses that do a lot of that drying action now. Uh, so it's forced dried, if you like. It changes the flavor of the peat already, for better or for worse, either way. Whiskey Man Sam, Monarch Perth, good to see you both. Um, so, how long has... Okay, commercially, avail commercially produced whiskey in Scotland has been going on since 18th century. Um, however, uh, there was whiskey being produced in Scotland pre 18th century, but in commercial sense, uh, I think the date generally accepted somewhere around 1715, 1720, somewhere around there. I can't remember the exact date that Glen Turret started making whiskey. They're one of the earliest distilleries, uh, commercial distilleries, I should say. So it used to be ground by the, peat used to be far more commonly used in mainland distilleries. And you've got to remember most peat comes from the mainland. In Scotland, a lot of it is in Isla, and there's that misconception that oh, Isla whiskey is always peated, so therefore the peat must come from Isla. Both those statements are incorrect. Not all Isla whiskey is peated. In fact, a lot of it is unpeated. A lot of Kalila, a lot of uh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. a lot of Bunahaven, and and other distillers. I'm sure off the top of my head, Brooklady, Kalila, and Bunahaven. I know do regular unpeated runs. In fact. In many cases, especially distilleries like uh, Brooklady, the bulk of their output is unpeated. I can't remember for the other two off the top of my head. But uh, yeah, so these days, there's a lot more distilleries doing peated whiskies on the mainland than there was even just five or 10 years ago. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is the popularity of peated whiskies coming back. More people are into their peated whiskey. They like that smoky, iodine-y, peaty flavor. Uh, Whiskey Girl Collection, good to see you again. Uh, we missed you at the Christmas party this last year, Whiskey Girl Collection. Whiskey Steens, good to see you. Malia Barry. Uh, Whiskey Zach. Felicia, good to see you. Some Ryan guy, good to see you. Look, everyone's tuning in. That's great. 8 p.m. I'm here. So, I'm talking a bit about Pete, so you can rewind and watch that if you want. But um, I'm talking about how it was, for many years it was used, for a long time it was used in Scotland as a fuel source for keeping houses warm. That's how people kept warm. You'd light peat in your fireplace. It was an even burning, clean way of, of keeping warm. It's less commonly used in the Scottish homes and and uh, um, and whatnot these days because uh, it's much more access to gas and wood and fire and whatnot. However, uh, access to fire. God, I've had a long day. Um, uh, but in that in, in that being said, um, it's still being used, obviously, quite commercially in Scotch whiskey production for malting the barley. So it's the first stage, I wanna talk about that for a second. It's the first stage of malting the barley. The peat is introduced, it halts the germination, and it, and it roasts the barley and gives it a smoky flavor. If you're not peating with, if you're not using um, peat, you might be a distillery like Glen Goyne that uses, I believe, um, I'll get back to you on that, wood smoke. Uh, they, I think they burn wood. 
but I don't think it's um it's not peat. They don't use any peat at Glen Goyne. But every other distillery in Scotland uses an element of peat in the malting of their barley, whether it be by specification or whether it be made by themselves. Um, and yeah, that's there you go. There's very few distilleries, by the way, in Scotland that actually malt their own barley. Most of them use commercial malters these days, um, and they they set it to a specification that is for their product. So uh, there are some distilleries like Benriac, uh, Springbank, Highland Park, Laphroaig, a few distilleries that um, Kilhoman that malt their own barley, do a little bit. And no, no distillery in Scotland does 100% of their output malted barley, by the way. Like, I think Laphroaig's is like 10%. Uh, I think Brooklady, I think is something like, um, if I remember from the tour correctly, 30 or 35%. You just, it's just not economical to do it all yourself. But some distilleries are trying to get to that high, get to a higher number. Some only malt to, I think, 5% of their output is their own malted barley that they do on site, like Benriac, I think. Um, and it's usually integrated into their own releases. Or in Springbank's case, you often see things like, um, well, actually, I think Springbank, oh, God. I should learn more about this stuff before I talk about it. But, but I'm, I'm just sort of, I'm scrolling back here. But I think Springbank do almost, if not all, their own malted barley. But then there's some distilleries that use local barley as well, and they'll often have that as a point of difference on their releases. Um, our hands, Sally, Sable, Scotch. Ah, look at this, full house tonight. Whiskey and drinkies. I have a bottle of Sheep's Dung Smoked Whiskey from Iceland. Yeah, Whiskey Steens, I think I've, I think I've seen that. Is that that flocky stuff? Um, is, it, is it a flocky or is it something else? Um, either way, I did not enjoy it, I'll be honest with you. Uh, <laughs> uh, Nick Huzek, is Isla Peak different from Peak in mainland Scotland? Nick, yes it is. They are different types of peat sauce depending on where they come from. It's a really good question, Nick. So the peat on the mainland is generally uh, considered to be drier uh, and is generally considered to be sort of more smoke oriented, whereas peat on the in Isla is generally considered to be boggier, uh, damper, and gives it a more iodine -y character. That's not always the case, but it is often the case. So depending on which peat bog you get it from, it is organic matter. It's going to be different in different places. I wouldn't say that Isla peat is radically different from mainland peat. It is different. Um, just as peat from Australian peat is different from Scottish peat quite substantially, but that's a quite a different climate. Yes, we do have some peat bogs in Tasmania. I'm sure other places in Australia. Um, but uh, yeah, and it's not commonly used in Australia either. Uh, that's why there's not, there's not too many. I mean, it doesn't make sense to really produce too much peated whiskey in Australia given how how uh, few peat how how little peat there is really especially compared to Scotland where it's considered like thirty or thirty five percent of the um of, of ground mass can be can, can be used for peating. Uh, isn't it true the peated Irish whiskies are flooding this year in Australia? Marley up Barry Barry I'll I'll believe that when I see it. I don't think we're going to see a, like a flood of it. People have been talking about an Irish whiskey flood for years, mind you. Um, I think we're still on the early cusp of it. I think we're going to see a lot more Irish whiskey coming through in the next few years. But you've got to understand, so there's a few big distilleries over there already. You've got Middleton Distillery, uh, New Jamison Distillery, etc. You've got um, um, uh, Bush Mills. You've got uh, Cooley. So you've got a few big distilleries over there um, that produce a number of different brands for different products. But I don't think we're going to... And, you know, the new Teeling Distillery is up online now. And um, it's all sourced stock up until now, as far as I know. I don't think we've seen any... Uh, of their own product on the market yet, but um, source stock is in like Teeling came from Cooley, I think from from memory. Again, I'm not really sure off the top of my head. Um, how long does it take to come back? Asks Whis Whiskey Zach. Um, or is it like coal? Once it's dug up, it's gone. Well, unlike coal, see, we've not run out of coal because coal keeps well. <laughs> well, okay. It does come back. It does come back. It just takes uh, a few million years, from what I understand. I don't know what that rate is. It's it's faster than other um, Earth, but it's um it's still there's something like I remember some some environmental report that said there's somewhere between eleven and twelve million years worth of peat left in Scotland alone. So I think there's a few more years of whiskey drinking still to go. But anyway, I won't talk too technically tonight. Um, but anyway, this the peat is often uh, part of the identity of a whiskey. But I like to treat peat, if you're a beer nerd at all, if anyone here is a bit of a beer nut, um, I like to treat peat a bit like um, beer makers should treat should treat hops. Uh, in that, When you find a, a whiskey that's got a really nice balance of malt character, spirit character, cask influence, and peat, 
uh, it can be wonderful. It's a truly wonderful whiskey, and there's a balance and and um, a, a syrupiness to it, and a full flavored smoky uh, adventure to be had. But just like some, but some whiskies can be overly peated, in my opinion. You can get these whiskies that um, proudly exclaim that they've got 200 ppm, 300 ppm, things like that, parts per million. I should identify there um, of peating levels and of peat measurement in the uh, in the barley or in the spirit or at the cut. And I think that you get to this point where these whiskies, some of these really hugely peated ones, commercially available ones, I should say, uh, they end up being um, they end up being over the top. They get they get it just turns into this really sort of like overly peaty, sludgy thing, like a really bad beer, like a really bad IPA or double IPA, where it's just hops. And I think that's a real shame. And you see these um, beers on the market that are like, you know, they might be like 9, 10, 11% ABV. Uh, they're double, triple IPAs with wet and dry hop and double wet hopped or something they'll call them. And they just taste like hops. And it's a certain flavor that hops has, there's a certain flavor that Pete has. And I think you're going to overdo it and you lose balance. You lose any structural integrity and you lose any sort of um, niceties in the spirit that you were looking for. Let me grab some of these comments. Jeremy Donne, it's been a while. Happy well, mate. Um, Great Beyond Coburg joined. Um, I hear that Great Beyond Coburg have some, uh, have some really, um, uh, have all the wrong beers. <laughs> I'm kidding. It's a great little bottle shop. Um, a friend of mine runs, uh, Ryan, big shout out. You're doing great work uh, up in Coburg and Melbourne there. Worth checking out. Um, that's all good. And uh, <laughs> where's my bloody glass? We're like hops here, here. Yeah. Uh, with those big PD hop bomb things like the Emperor often has no clothes. Yes, that's a really good comment. It's like, you know, it, it's, they're these like, Pete is to whiskey what hops is to beer. It's like, they, they're just, it just turns into this sort of like, oh, I got really excited about 300 ppm. And it's just like, there's no balance to the spirit at all. And I'll, I'll be completely honest. If I'm going to name one, I'd say that I'm a huge fan of Brooklady, as many of my, uh, my friends and followers will know. Um, I think it's a fantastic distillery. I think they make a, a marvellous whiskey. I think Port Charlotte runs that they do, which is their heavily peated run of Port Charlotte, which is, I think, peated to 45 parts per million, 40 to 45, which is the same as most Isla distilleries, Ardbeg, Lagavulin, etc. Uh, yeah, I think that's fantastic whiskey as well. I just think that Octomore is all a bit marketing gimmick and over the top and it's just it's the triple ipa of whiskies if you like that kind of thing or like you, you you do you i just find for me it's a little bit uh one dimensional uh and american oak is to Sh- australia is is to australian shiraz 1995 2010 yeah <laughs> no i wouldn't agree with that um i think american oak is is actually should be the future of, of whiskey in many ways um but yeah look I, I won't t- i'm not talking casks too much tonight uh, that's, an, that's, that's a topic for another night. No, now what I've got in front of me here are two peated whiskies deliberately from very different distilleries and very different styles of peat. And I was going to just pour a little nose of each and talk a little bit about each one. One of them I think you can, is going to be out soon. Uh, this is a new release for us. I don't um, know the date we're going to be releasing this, but I'll, I'll announce it when we do. Don't worry. It's called 135.15 Back to the Suture. <laughs> I think the panel are having a bit of fun this day. Uh, it's in the heavily peated category. That one there, Back to the Suture. And then we've got a um, uh, 29.233 Permeating Sweet Smoke. This one came out a long time ago, uh, you know, two, three years ago, I should say. Uh, this is a 20-year-old whiskey from Distillery 29. Uh, a friend very graciously left a bottle of this behind for me. So um, let's have a, just a, I'm just going to pour a tiny bit of each. It's just really a nose and taste comparison here. I'll put the 29 on my left. Should be your left as well, actually, I can't, well, anyway. And a tiny bit of 135. Now, you'll notice, first of all, I mean, yes, one is an eight-year-old heavily peated. One is a 20-year-old peated. Um, and they, they're they both very different whiskies. Let me move that jug so you can see what's going on here. Uh, make sure that's in, in frame a bit there. Okay. I'll put them there. It makes a bit more sense. Um, so one is actually quite a bit, a uh, little bit darker. The 21 is, is a bit darker. We don't use any artificial color in society whiskies. Um, single cask, of course, for both of them. I'm going to nose the 29 first. Ah, oh. see, that is a subtlety of smoke. That is a delicate, lovely, subtle smoke. That one, very sweet, very sweet. Like permeating sweet smoke is a good name for that one. It says on the tasting note on the bottle: maple cured bacon, warm sweet smoke. Yeah, and a cigar smoke to it. 
It's got that old cigar, that old polished cigar thing. Maple, maple glazed ribs. Smoky maple ribs. Could have been called smoky maple ribs this one, but it's far more subtle than smoky maple ribs. It's almost like uh, smoky maple bacon or... Oh, Monster of Malt. Bob Wenting, Dwyer's, Matthew Sanderson. Good to see you all. If, if you've just joined, we're talking about peat. Peated whiskies, smoke, peat, and having a chat about how it's, how, where it comes from, how it's made, some of the basics of peat, and phenols and flavours that it imparts into the barley. And to do a, a, do a comparison, if you've just joined, I've poured a 29233 from a little while back, a 20-year-old from an Isla distillery, distillery number 29 in Isla. It's a big distillery that is, many people say the name wrong. And, um, and I've poured a little dram of 135.15, a heavily, super heavily peated single cask from the 135, a mainland peated whiskey. But I'm just, I'm just, uh, Bob, good morning. <laughs> it's never too early for a dram, right? So I've had a good nose of that 29. It's lovely. You could almost mistake it from being from a sherry cask. It's an, oh, well, it's an ex Madeira cask. There we go. Now let's, um, oi, <laughs> That is definitely heavily peated. You don't even need to come too close to the glass on this 135. It's definitely suture. It's back to the suture indeed. Oh man, on the nose on that one. Um, it's pure like hospital, farmyardy, proper like bucket of tar and an old chimney. You know, they're just so different. I mean, if you're in the mood for something with a bit of style and elegance and grace, old Isla whiskey, the peat fades after a few years in a bottle. In the cask, I should say, sorry. Uh, the peat fades on older whiskies, but what they gain, lose in peat smoke, they gain in complexity. You get those lovely wood sugars. Peter Galotta, good to see you, Peter. Uh, Back Jerry joined. Uh, good to see you, Jack. Uh, love you, Peter. Thanks, mate. Yeah. Like, yeah, that's like honey smoky bacon, but it's not like, it's not just a peat stack. Whereas Back to the Suture here, which is an upcoming cask for us, is uh, yeah, it's farmyard funk and peat bricks right in your face. Ooh, the nose on both of those is just, just delightful. But so radically different. This is the thing about peated whiskey. They can be very different. Isla whiskey, mainland whiskey, world whiskies that are peated. And what age does that whiskey? Younger whiskies, like a lovely eight year old single cask, have so much power and depth and just a real whack in the face to them. If you like younger, whis younger peated whiskies, I know I certainly do, and they have this, um, when I drink a good peated whiskey, it's, it's very rare that I'm looking for that kind of subtlety and old and like super aged uh, character in an, in an Isla whiskey. It's not often a, a, a profile in whiskey that I uh, yearn for very often. I really do fall for the, the super heavily peated stuff when it comes to younger whiskey sometimes, but it's like I said before, it needs to have that malt balance. It needs to have a balance of, of wood and peat and malt and spirit character coming through. And it does. And it's just amazing to see what heavily peated whiskey from a mainland distillery can be like and how different it is. It is a drier style of peat. It's much more like, it's quite nasal. It was the kind of peat that really hits you in the back of the eyeballs. <laughs> Whereas these ones are quite sort of, um, quite, uh, quite subtle, quite gentle. Very, very, very different indeed. So that's our little chat about Pete tonight. If you've got any, if you've got any questions, throw them up because this is just a chance for us to have uh, a 20 minute chat, as I say each night, um, about different subjects. Some of the subjects in the, this first month in January, this will be our, I think I've almost done 20 this month already, um, 20th uh, live stream, I should say, for the year. Some of these chats are a chance for us to do a bit of back to basics, talk about peat, talk about water, talk about some of the basics of, of whiskey production, of whiskey enjoyment, and things like that. Um, and I'm going to talk a bit more about whiskey enjoyment as a as as we venture into the next few weeks, especially. And I'm really looking forward to it. Um, so let me let me grab some of these questions coming through. Uh, Jamie Poo's 1985, Jay Hood 77. Nick Husek asks, how important is PPM for peatiness? Nick, you know what? Our cellar master Andrew wrote a great article on on uh, uh, whiskey and wisdom. Um, I, f I think I'm going to say even a couple of years ago now about how um, PPM is not a very good indicator of how peaty a whiskey is at all. Have you ever had, I bet, uh, uh, Nick, here's a good example for you. There's some whiskies out there which are things like, I'd say, Ardbeg 10. I think Ardbeg 10 is peated 40 parts per million. 
It's 40, 4-0. Uh, that sounds like a low number, especially with some of these uh, heavily marketed things like Octomore that have got, you know, 300 ppm in some cases. Is a 300 ppm whiskey six times peatier, five times, five or six times peatier than a, um, a, a 40 ppm whiskey? No, not at all. In fact, I would even argue side by side, if the proof was brought down to a sim comparable level, they'd be, be almost as peaty as each other. PPM is not an indicator of how peaty whiskey is. Um, it's not, not at all. That's, to answer your question in a nutshell, it's not. It all comes down to where, A, where was that PPM measured? Where was the measurement point? Was it at the cut of the peat? Or was it at the spirit still? Or was it at the, at the finished product? Because all three numbers are gonna be very different. Um, so therefore, the, the actual PPM number, they're just gonna pick the highest one because it looks better. We don't, re we don't print PPMs in the bottles. Um, we print either lightly peated, peated, or heavily peated in the flavor profile, or oily and coastal. Oily and coastal drams have a bit of peat in them. Um, yeah, so... <laughs> uh, let me grab some of these other questions. How would you compare Australian peat to Scottish peat? Uh, Australian peat is very, it's very, um, I've, I've tasted some great Australian whiskies that have been peated whiskies, and they include some, lar especially some larks in the last few years. And um, they're very, um, what's the word for it? Uh, they're, they're, <laughs> they're very boisterous. Like a lot of Australian product, a lot of Australian beers are quite big and boisterous. A lot of, oh, maybe not so much beers. I, don't know, I mean, more, on, like more and more craft beers are. Um, a lot of Australian red wines are big and boisterous, as you know, big spicy Shirazes that we love in this climate. And the same for, our, for Australian peated whiskies. I find them mostly to be quite sort of big, boisterous peated whiskies. There are some there are some exceptions to that rule, I'll say, however, and that thing comes down to more timing cask and type of cask that they've been using, which has mellowed them out a bit more. And that'd be the likes of Bakery Hill and a few other Aussie distilleries that I think do great peated whiskies um, as well for local seed whiskies. Um, so they're very different, but generally it's quite a it's quite a Australian peat. I find to be quite in your face, quite aggressive, a bit like, you know, a bit like Australian red wines. They're very comparable. It's the it's the Australian palate in a way. It's what people like. They like those big, bold flavors, um, which is why things like French and Italian wines don't sell very well in Australia compared to Aussie wines. It's also, it also comes down to, you know, having access to great local wine. Why would you need to buy French wine kind of argument? Um, but it's still that sort of thing. Like it's, you know, I still think that there's a lot to be said about great uh, subtlety, great nuance in a whiskey or a wine in that case um, that is often lost in some of these Australian peated whiskies. But there's also, like I said, not really enough peat to, there's not, we don't have that sort of like that culture around peated whiskey that that peated whiskey seems to warm you up a bit more than normal whiskey, I think, I think in some cases. So with the warm climate that Australia is, um, it seems a bit sort of redundant. Um, whiskey Steens asks, your opinion on smoky cokies. <laughs> He's wondering what it means, you know. What, uh, you know what, I've, done, I've had some marvelous smoky cokies in my time. Uh, I was with Scott Fitzsimons, shout out to the Oak Barrel, uh, when we cracked open, I think it was the third release, or fourth release, Port Ellen, and uh, mixed it with normal, good old fashioned Coca-Cola. You know what, it's a bit of fun. It's total blasphemy. And you know what, If sometimes it's just fun to put in have a smoky cokey. It's a classic. It's a classic recipe. You know what the recipe is? Ice, if you like it, uh, in a glass or paper cup, and then put your desired amount of smoky whiskey and your desired amount of coke on top. There you go, whiskey and coke. Make it fancy. Actually, my, one of my favourite ones. If I'm if I'm being a bit um, uh, a bit uh, no, I don't know what the word is for that. Anyway, one of my favourite ones was one of my own. There you go. Um, uh, we created this uh, one-off cocktail each night for our Archie Rose pop-up bar. The last two years, we've done it, and um, each of those, yeah, each of those nights we had a uh, <laughs> a different cocktail, and one of them was literally whiskey and coke. One one night, where we mixed in a um, Society sixty six with a Wattle Seed PS forty cola and a garnish. I could, yeah, I don't think you can get much fancier than in, than that really. Um, has a new outturn been sent out yet? Uh, I, I think it's going out this week, Rowan. I think it's in I think it's in Mailhouse already. It's already I know it's already all locked in the bag. It's already approved. The contents all laid down for it. So you know I think it's in on, it's on its way, Rowan. I've given I've given away two previews. I've talked about Mortal of the Month, which is sixteen point three nine, which is an eighteen year old deep rich and dried fruits cask, and I gave another preview, which was the Rolling in Fruit Blossom, the ninety one. That's all gone now. Uh, and there's one more preview I'm going to do, which will be. Do tomorrow night, I think. I've got one more whiskey I want to preview, and I can see it on the other side of the camera now. 
That's exciting. It's an old and dignified. I'll talk about that tomorrow night, I think. Yes. Uh, what foods would you pair a PD whiskey with? Great question, Bob. Ah, uh, so food, food pairings with whiskey is is a fine art. It really is, um, which is why we've you know society's worked with uh, numerous. Uh, chefs uh, and um, food scientists in doing pairings at our events before. It's been a lot of fun. We're still doing them every year. In fact, uh, Andrew's got something uh, in the bag which he'll be announcing soon, which will be very cool as well about all that. And so do I, actually. I've got one I'm going to announce soon as well. But it's a work in progress, and we've been working on it today a fair bit. Um, in terms of foods to pair with if you're just at home, things that you can really enjoy with it, a lot of people like to refer to, when it comes to peated whiskeys, they like to refer to um, blue cheese, um, I'm, I love, I love blue cheese, but I find it's not always the best pairing with, um, peated whiskey because I find blue cheese for my palate actually overwhelms a lot of the, the nuance and the flavor in the peated whiskey. Even if it's cast strength and heavily peated, you can often be like, oh, all I can taste now is blue cheese. That's why I, when it comes to peated whiskeys, I tend towards, uh, mostly fish based, seafood based, um, like smoked salmon, uh, or sashimi or, uh, ocean trout and, um, or some caviar. I love that kind of stuff with smoky whiskies, especially. So, I like because I like caviar and you know smoked salmon are quite subtle in flavour. A lot, I went mean, smoked salmon is probably on the on the slightly heavier end of flavours, but it, you know what I mean. It's a, there's a bit more sort of subtlety and it complements the whiskey rather than detracts from it or overpowers it. Hope that answers your question. Whiskey Taylor joined. I think you're just coming into the tail end now, Whiskey Taylor, because we're just about to wrap up. But I really appreciate you all tuning in as always and being a part of the society live streams. Both Andrew and I do these live streams and, and both Andrew and I check the messages on here. So please um, always appreciate your questions. Send them through. And I love talking to you guys and taking in your great questions. Uh, Buffalo mozzarella. Yeah, that's a really good point, uh, Matt Music MW. Buffalo mozzarella. So try Birdie Beetle chocolate. It surprised me with my whiskey chocolate matching. Uh, okay, Birdie Beetle chocolate. That's a very specific request, but I'll look it up. So you know, actually, that's a good point just before I finish. Dark chocolates, like dark chocolates and peated whiskey as well. And I don't mean like 85, 90% cocoa. I mean like those just nice 55, 65% ones that are like, um, you know, they've still got a lovely bit of subtlety to it, but the bitterness of the cocoa, again, doesn't overwhelm the spirit. Okay, with that said, uh, a few quick little announcements. Outturn is the 7th of Feb this year, but of course on the 6th of Feb is our Outturn preview in Melbourne that has sold out long ago. Melbourne members, however, put the 28th of March in your diaries now. About 3, 4 p.m. that day on the 28th of March. It's a Saturday afternoon in Melbourne. You're going to love it. Even if you're not a Melbourne member, you might want to be in Melbourne that day if you catch my drift. Um, uh, so the second announcement is our turns on the 7th and our Archie Rose uh, Gelato Whiskey Pairings on the 8th. Uh, love to see you all there. I'd love to uh, share some more whiskey with you and I'll see you all tomorrow night. Thanks again for tuning in. Thanks for talking to me about Pete. You can always watch the full version of this episode on our stories on our Instagram. Uh, just go to our just go to our page, hit the little icon. It'll play it for you in full. Or if it's easier, more convenient, in about 20 minutes' time, it'll be up on YouTube. Have a great night, and I'll see you all tomorrow. Cheers.